week's portion, this week's parsha, parsha's Vayichi. Vayichi Yaakov Eretz and Sorim Shvaz Vayishan. Yaakov lived in the land of Egypt for 17 years. Vayichi Yimei Yaakov, Shnei Chayov, Sheva Shon Varboim Mashono. He lived, his life was 147 years. Vayikravu Yimei Yisrael, Lomos, the days of Yisrael came close to pass on. Vayikra Levinoi Gli Yosef, and he summons, he calls his son Yosef, Vayomelo Imnomot Zechim Veinecho, if I find favor in your eyes, Simno Yotcho Tach Shirechi, put your hand under my thigh, Vasisa Yimodi Chesed Venes, and you will do with me a true kindness. Anosik bring Mitzrayim. Please don't bury me in Egypt. Yosef being the viceroy, he has no question the ability to fulfill his request, and that's why he's asking him rather than asking any of the other sons. So if Yosef is the viceroy, basically the most powerful person in the world. His power originally, when he chose him and appointed him to be the viceroy, he said to him, Raka kise eglomi meko, the only thing I, I'm above you is, is only the throne. But in terms of any decision regarding the country, you are the supreme opinion. So if this is the case, Yaakov definitely trusted his son implicitly that whatever request he makes of him, he'll fulfill his request. Yosef definitely had the capability of fulfilling his request. So if that's the case, why did Yaakov have to adjure Yosef regarding taking an oath? He bound him by a shvua, by an oath. Why wasn't Yosef's word sufficient for Yaakov to be assured and satisfied that his request would be addressed? After he passes away. But evidently, if Yaakov adjured him and made him take the oath, the shvua, evidently, it wasn't sufficient. Without the shvua, his request would not be fulfilled. Now the question is, why not? We find that after Yaakov passes away, he's buried in the cave of Machpelah, before, before, after Yaakov passes away, Yosef goes to Paro, and he asks Paro, he says, I would like, my father had adjured me to bury him in Canaan, in the tomb of Machpelo. So Paro says to Yosef, you could bury your father as he has requested, but he says, as your father adjured you, that the reason why I'm allowing you to bury your father in Canaan, so Rashi cites Chazal, he was very clear, if not for the oath that you take to your father, I would not allow you to bury your father in, in Canaan. But he was afraid to say, violate the oath to Yosef. If you ask me to violate the oath that I take to my father, I will violate the oath that I take to you. That Yosef was proficient in 70 languages. In addition to the 70 languages, he was, he was fully versed in Loshon HaKodesh in Hebrew. Paro only knew 70 languages. Yosef knew 71 languages. Paro had adjured Yosef to take an oath that he will never reveal that he knows one language more than him. That was, and he was bound by this oath and he never revealed it. So if that's the case, if you ask me to violate the oath I take to my father, I'll violate your oath. And Paro did not want this to become public knowledge. So therefore, he, Paro was saying, the only reason why why am I allowing you to bury your father, 
only because of the oath. Because you have to violate the oath if you don't, and if you would violate that oath, you you would vi violate the oath that you're taking to me. Therefore, I have no choice but to allow you to go. So Yaakov originally, Yaakov originally, when he adjured Yosef to take the oath, it wasn't a question that he didn't trust him. But he understood that unless he has this situation over Paro, Paro is not allowing him to, to take him out of Egypt. He's not allowing him. What's the reason? Why did Yaakov not want to be buried in Mitzrayim? So Rashi cites three reasons. But one of the primary reasons is <coughs> that he was concerned he'd be deified. Because Yaakov was a holy man. When Yaakov came to Egypt, the famine ceased. It was only, in effect, two years. Initially, it was meant to be, in effect, seven years. So the people saw Yaakov as a holy person. Due to the blessing that Yaakov had given to Paro, the Nile rises whenever Paro goes to the Nile. This man has supernatural powers. So what's going to be when he dies? They're going to deify him. Yaakov says, I'll no secret him. Sorry, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. I don't want to be deified. That's the reason. So Paro had every reason to retain Yaakov to remain in Egypt. His remains should be there. And he'd make a shrine and they would worship his grave. They would worship him as a deity. Yaakov understood this. Therefore, the only way Yaakov was able to extricate himself and Yosef should have the upper hand over Paro is by adjuring him to make Yosef take the oath and the only way he would not be taken out, he'd have to violate the oath. That would force Paro's hand to allow him to be buried in Canaan, in the Mars Pelo. It seems to be difficult. We'd read that initially when Yosef was in prison with the Sarah Mashkim, the wine steward, and the Sarah Ofim, the baker, they had a dream and he interprets the dreams. The wine steward's dreams were interpreted to mean after three days he's going to be reinstated as the wine steward. The baker is going to be hanged in three days. And the dream actually came about as Yosef had interpreted the dream. So Yosef, after he interprets the dream of the wine steward, the Sarah Mashkim, he says to him, Remember me and mention me to Paro. Because he said those two words, Yosef remained another two years in prison, based on a posuk in Tehillim, that you should not put your faith in heathens, but rather in God. Yosef taking the initiative to ask the Sarah Mashkim to remember him and to mention him was considered a lack of faith. Therefore, for that lack of faith, he spent another two years in, in prison. It seems to be difficult. Chazal tell us that of the patriarchs of the Ovos HaKadoshim, who was the most special of the patriarchs? Yaakov. Yaakov was the Bechir Sheba Ovos. He was the chosen, he was the choicest of all the patriarchs. He's the one who fathered the 12 tribes. Yaakov is Yaakov Ishtam Yashiv Olim. Yaakov is the, is the patriarch who prepared for the exile that they were able to survive the 210 years being in Egypt and ultimately going to Sinai to become the Avon Nifchar, to become the chosen people. Yosef was less than his father and for taking initiative when he shouldn't have, he's held accountable for, as a lack of faith. Yaakov, the Bechir Shabavos, he says to Yosef, I don't want to be buried in, in Egypt, I want to be buried in Canaan. And he takes an initiative, takes an initiative and he adjures Yosef to swear that he, and he works out this ploy. Uh, why am I taking, why, why, do, why am I adjuring you? Because if Paro would ask you to violate the oath which I bound you to, you'll violate his oath. So it's a whole ploy over here. What about relying on God? If it's meant to be, you can be buried in Canaan, you'll be buried in Canaan. Why take any initiatives here? Why is this initiative here not considered a lack of faith? Yosef's initiative was a lack of faith, and according to Rebbeinu Bachir, the way he explains it, that if you're at that special level, you have that special relation with Hashem, if it's meant to be, it'll be, whenever it's meant to be. When Yosef was meant to be released from prison, he would have been released from prison. He didn't have to rely on a heathen. Hashem would have released him if it was meant to be released at that moment. So Yo Yaakov, who's greater than Yosef, much greater, he's the father of Klal Yisrael, there's no question. If he was meant to be buried in, in the Mars of the request alone would be enough. 
Yosef, bury me there. What do you have to come up with the ploy? I want you to take an oath, and therefore, if Paro should choose to violate your oath, then you violate his oath. And that will force his hand. What do you have to force anybody's hand? What about Bitochon? Have faith. Have faith in Hashem. Why is this considered a breach of faith? That's firstly. Secondly, you make it even more difficult. What did Hashem say to Yaakov before he went to Egypt? Yaakov was, was fearful about going to Egypt. Before he descends to Egypt, Hashem appears to him and says, I am your God of your father. Don't be fearful about going down to Egypt. I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt. And I will bring you back. God is giving him a guarantee. I'm going down with you, I'm bringing you back. So if that's the case, even more so, if Hashem says, I will bring you back, what, what, do, you, what do you have to rely on anybody? What if they create a whole ploy to guarantee that you're going to be brought back? For what reason? And yet, Yaakov is not held accountable for this. Yosef was held accountable for those two words. And because he expressed those two words, which were an indication of lack of faith, so here, firstly, it should have been lack of faith. Secondly, even more so, he had a guarantee. Hashem says, Anochi alcho gamolo, I will bring you back. So if Hashem is going to bring you back, is there a question Hashem is not going to bring him back? Of course he's going to bring him back. Now, we find from Avinu that he was told, and this was the first test, or maybe the second test, Lech l'cha mi'artzchum l'artzcha beisovicho, leave your homeland, your birthplace, your family, and where should you go? El or to the land that I will show you. And what's going to happen if you actually meet the test, make you into a great nation, meaning now you have no children, you will have children. You have no renown, you will have renown. You have no wealth, you will have wealth. Okay? They're in Canaan for three months. What happens? They're struck with a famine. So, Avram says to Sorrow, we're going to Egypt. But he says to Sarah, but you realize you're a beautiful woman. And the Egyptians, when they see your beauty, what are they going to do? They're going to kill me, and they'll take you as, 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 the, as, as the wife. Imri no achosiot. Please present you, say to them that I'm your brother. And therefore, I'll be able to live. Otherwise, they're going to kill me. God says, at this moment, Avram had no children. So if Avram had no children, what, 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 what do you have to take initiative? Have faith. If you're going to have faith, it's going to work out. Because he, at this moment, you haven't yet produced offspring. He has no offspring. So why does he have to take any level of initiative to what? To somehow protect his life that he should be able to extricate himself from this dangerous situation. But you find Avram took initiative. He took initiative. And taking initiative is not a lack of faith. Yosef's initiative was a lack of faith. And here even more so, even more so, God gave uh, Yaakov the guarantee, I will go down with you, I will bring you back. So if he says I'm going to bring you back, there's no question. So if you learn, understand the Ramban writes over there, Nachmaradis, that Avram's going to Egypt was, 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 was a sin. He should have had faith, he shouldn't have gone to Egypt. He shouldn't have gone to Egypt. So if that's the case, that that he had requested of, sorry, Menu, Imrino Achosiot, tell, tell them you're my sister, I'm your brother, that was only a consequence of his failing in faith. If he would have never gone to Egypt, he would have put himself in that situation. According to Ramban. It was, it, was a fa it was a lack of faith. If he would have faith, he would have stayed the course, despite the fact that there was a famine in Egypt. He failed, and because he failed, that's why he went to Egypt. That's the Ramban. So therefore, that's not difficult. But how do we understand Yaakov? Yaakov, with the guarantee that I will bring you back, we find he takes initiative, and he doesn't have faith. 
Why is that considered a claim against him? And it's not. We find that Mark tells us that when Yosef was in prison and it was the night before he was to be released and Yaakov Yosef had a meteoric rise immediately. Within a number of hours he went from slave incarcerated prisoner to be the viceroy of Egypt. He stood alongside the king's chariot. But he had to be prepared for that position. Hashem sends Gabriel the archangel when he's in prison, the night before he's released, he teaches him 70 languages. Until that, maybe Yo- Yo- Yosef was, spoke Hebrew and Egyptian. But all the other languages he did not. But if you're going to reach that level of royalty and interact with royalty, you have to speak, you have to be well-versed, fluent in 70 languages. Miraculously, Yaakov, Yosef was taught 70 languages. Gabriel, the archangel Gabriel, was sent to teach him 70 languages. He ascends, he's released from prison, interprets the dreams. Paro says to his courtiers, have you ever seen a man so endowed with the Spirit of God, with such wisdom, he will be the viceroy. Yossi became the mashbir and the shalit. He became the sustainer and the ruler of Egypt. When he became the ruler, the astrologers say to Paro, it's inappropriate. A man who's a sense to that position, he has to be fluent in 70 languages. He's not. So Paro says, I have a sense of him that there's streaks of royalty in him. He's not just an ordinary person. So he's not a slave. But they said, but factually, he doesn't speak the languages. So they began speaking to him. And sure enough, he was able to, to converse in them, with them in the 70 languages. That's what happened. Paro was concerned because he realized that Yosef knew 71 languages. Paro only knew 70 languages. And this was an issue because that means he knows one language and as much as Paro tried to learn Hebrew, the Gemara tells us he wasn't able to retain it. Yosef was 71, Paro was 70. Paro realized he has a problem. So he jurors Yosef to take the oath that he will never reveal that he knows one language more than him. Now the question is, Yosef was known for his integrity. The way he conducted himself in the household of Potiphar, who was a minister in the court of Paro, he was known. So if he was known, his word was the equivalent of taking an oath. Why did Paro have a lack of confidence and he wasn't confident only if he takes the oath. Why? He adjured him to take the oath, to take the shore. So evidently, he did, wasn't that confident. He would, would, did not want to rely on his integrity, on his word, that he would not reveal it. He felt an oath, he will not, he will not violate an oath. But why do you have to take an oath? The answer is because Hashem wanted Yosef to take an oath. God wanted Yosef to take an oath. Why did God want Yosef to take an oath? Because God wanted Yosef to be bound by an oath not to reveal this fact. Yaakov was fully aware what happened because when he came to Egypt he shared with his father that he, take, he had taken an oath not to reveal to the world that he knows one language more than Paro. So Yaakov, how does he process this? Why did God want Yosef to take an oath? Because he understands from that that as much as he wants to be buried in Canaan, Paro will not allow him to leave. Unless he jures Yosef to take an oath. Meaning he's reading, this is the Ashkocha. How is it meant to be? How is it meant to evolve and unfold? That Hashem says, I will go down with you and I will bring you up. Yaakov understands, I have to adjure Yosef to take an oath. If Paro adjured and compelled Yosef to take the oath, and he did not rely on his integrity, that tells us, tells him that I have to have Yosef take the oath. Because if he doesn't take the oath, Paro is not going to allow it. But that is the Ashkocha. God wants that the Ashkocha (coughs) should unfold and evolve in this context. So Yaakov adjuring Yosef 
to bury him in Canaan and not to bury him in Egypt is not a, a violation of faith. It's not a breach of faith. This is doing exactly what Hashem wants you to do. As a result of that, he jured Yosef, that wasn't considered sin. This is within the context of, I will go down with you and I will bring you back. We find that when Yaakov went to Egypt, the Torah tells us, what did he bring with him? So in last week's reading, they took the livestock and the possessions that they had amassed in the land of Canaan. So there's, there's something evidently missing here. What about all the wealth that he had amassed in Choram? When he left his father's home, he was very wealthy. The story with the speckled and the spotted sheep, he became phenomenally wealthy. But it says that that was Choram. That was not the land of Canaan. But it says the only thing that he brought to the land of Canaan was the wealth that he amassed, his possessions that he amassed in Canaan. What happened to all the wealth that he had amassed in Choron? When he was, he spent six years amassing wealth before he left Choron. So Rashi cites the Midrash. What he had amassed in Padna Ram, which is Choron, Hakol Nosan Le'esov, Bishul Chelko B'Morsam Achpelo. He gave it all to Esau for the, his share in the Tumach Pelo to be buried there. Omar, what did he say? Nechse Chutz Loretz. The possessions which I had amassed outside of Canaan, the Chutz Loretz, it's not worth it to me that I shall retain them. Barosli, so what did he do with all those possessions? Hemet Lot Sivurin Shel Zobah Chesef, Kimit Kri. He made a pile of gold and silver as if you would take, up, take in a harvest, piled it up, he says to Esau, take it all. Because he had earned it, he had amassed it in Chutz Lord's outside of Eretz Canaan, what did he say? He says, it's not worth it. It's not worthwhile for me to take it. Why not? Possessions are possessions. Wealth is wealth. Does it make, what difference does it make if the wealth was amassed in Canaan or the wealth was amassed in Chutz Lord's? But he says, because it was amassed in Chutzlor, it's well, ain't it kadaili. It's not worth it to me. It's not worthwhile to me. What is it all about? Yaakov, we've said many times, is the patriarch that represents Goldos, exile. He's the patriarch of exile. Despite the fact that Choron was a depraved society, as it says in the Midrash, when Yaakov had request, Ushmarani to Hashem, watch over me, what did he have to be watched, protected from what? Gili Arayas, Vodazora. Adultery, incest, murder, and idolatry. That was, fear, that was the fear of the day. In Choron. With such a depraved, paganistic society, how is Yaakov able to raise a family that's so pure, where they're classified by the Shifteko? They're the tribes of God. They're so spiritually imbued, literally, untainted. Yaakov said, He sent a message to Esau, Although I sojourned with Esau, I observed, I conformed to the 613 mitzvahs. It's not only I performed and I kept, and I did not violate the 613 precepts of the Torah, I did not learn of his evil ways. I wasn't influence as much as Nyota. I saw evil for what it was. If you see evil for what it is, it has no effect on you. I mean, how did Yaakov have that ability to establish such a level of clarity at such an insular environment that the impurity of the community cannot seep into the neshamos, to the souls of his children and his wives? How did he do it? The answer is Yaakov is the patriarch of Golos. Yaakov is Ishtam Yoshi Boholim. He's the Patriarch who personifies Torah. Barasi Yitzor Barasi Torah Tavlin. The Torah is the antidote to all evil. Any impurity, Torah dispels that impurity. Yaakov himself was at such a dimension, he created his own island of holiness, of purity, nothing could penetrate. The walls of that island that he created, nothing could cross the boundary line. This was, this was Yaakov. So now we transpose Yaakov from Choron 
to Egypt. Egypt is a bastion of impurity, witchcraft, sorcery, adultery, incest, everything. You're bringing your family to Egypt. And this is the beginning, seemingly chas v'shon, the beginning of the end. How are they going to survive it? Even if you're not enslaved, but just being exposed to that decadent, depraved, impure society. A person goes into an opium den, even if you don't smoke opium. Just inhaling the smoke, you become addicted to opium. Going in that kind of environment, how is your neshama not tainted and not affected and undermined and eroded, spiritually speaking? How is this possible? Hashem says, you go, you have nothing to worry about. You go, Altira Meir de Mitzrayma, you have nothing to worry about. The paragraph structure of Ayichi, it's referred to as Parsha Stuma. It's a sealed Parsha. It's sealed regarding the way the paragraph structure is formed. Why is it a sealed Parsha? So Rashi cites Chazal that when Yaakov passed away, Nistemu Eneim Velibam Shel Shom Neashibut, Mitzar Sashibut. The eyes and the hearts of Israel became sealed because of the oppression of the bondage. Shishchil Shabdom. They began the bondage. Now we know the bondage did not start until that generation passed away. The generation of Yosef passed away. But yet it says, Rashi says Chazal, that why is it a, a sealed portion? To allude that the sealing is the sealing of the eyes and the hearts of the Jews. And this was the beginning of the bondage. So first of all, what bondage are we speaking about? We're not speaking about a physical bondage. In terms of the way they were esteemed and revered in Egyptian society, they were royalty. They are the family of Yosef. But what about the spiritual bondage? The impurity of Egypt now, after Yaakov passed away, began seeping into to the Neshamos. There's a subliminal erosion, spiritual erosion that's taking place. They're being affected. That's the Shibut. We sp- that, that is the bondage. As long as Yaakov was alive, that, that couldn't happen. Why? Because Yaakov, was, Yaakov himself, he created, as I said, he, we transposed Choron to Egypt. As a Choron, he created this insular spiritual environment that nothing was able to penetrate this spiritual structure, infrastructure which he created. Egypt could not penetrate that. It's as if Egypt didn't exist. They were on an island unto themselves. The spiritual environment. But when he passed away, it ceased to be. Now, why was Yaakov able to create this, which the Shifte Ka weren't able to create this? As great as they were, as great as Yosef was, they couldn't create this. But Yaakov was able to create this. Why was he able to create this? Chazal tell us Besides Yaakov being the most spe- special of the patriarchs, Yaakov himself, as the other Avram Yitzhak, they were the Merkava. They were the chariot of the Shekhinah. They were the equivalent of the Holy of Holies. Wherever Yaakov was, that's where the Divine Presence was. If Yaakov goes to Egypt, Hashem says, I will go down with you. What does that mean, I will go down with you? As you are the Merkava, as you are the chariot, as you were the equivalent, the Holy of Holies, of the Kochi Kadoshim. In Canaan, when I go to Egypt, you're the same, no less than that. In the presence of God, the intensity of that level of holiness, there's no impurity. What is the basis for impurity? If there's a vacuum, there's impurity. But if you have a presence on an infinite level, God's own presence, nothing can penetrate that, that, that location. As long as Yaakov is alive, where's the Shekhinah? Where's, where's the Divine Presence? In Egypt. Where in Egypt? Where Yaakov is with his family. So as long as he's there, they, they don't, they, they're not tainted as much as Nyota. Nothing could touch them. But what happens now? Yaakov passes away. As great as they are, the only thing that could spell and vaporize and negate 
This level of impurity, it's only the Shekhin itself. Only God's presence. But if Yaakov is not here, God's presence is no longer here. You have the holy people, but the vacuum, the void, there is a void. There's a level of deficiency. If there's deficiency, there's impurity. If there's impurity, it begins seeping in. Then the shamas become tainted. This is Hitzchut Tzoros Hashibut. The beginning of the bondage, the spiritual bondage has begun. This is Nisthu Enayim Velid Mitchell Yisro B'Shitei Tzoros Hashibut. So let's understand. Yaakov understood exactly what his objective and what his responsibility was. Now it's very interesting. We know there's no word that's superfluous in the Torah. We find that when Yaakov went out to Egypt, there were 70 members of his family went down with him. And when they went down, it seems to be, the Torah says, who went down to Egypt with the Yaakov? It says, Yaakov Chozaru Ito. And I always mention this. In Hebrew, there's no translation for the word S. Emo means with him. Emo. Im means with. Emo means with him, grammatically. Ito means with him also. S, the word S, is always an adjunct to whatever it's associated with. It's an adjunct. So what does Ito mean? It means also. Adjunct means with him. So what's the difference between Ito and Emo? If both words mean the same, what's the difference if the word is Emo or it's Ito? Both words in, in, the, in the literal translation mean the same, but has a different connotation. Emo means on par. Two people are with one another. And each one's on par with the other. Each one is emo. Each one's with the other. S is always an adjunct that's secondary. Meaning, you may be, in a so, be associated, but only as an adjunct. You're at a secondary level. So if you read the Torah here, it says, who came to Egypt? Yaakov Chozaro Ito. That's the emo. Yaakov and all his progeny with him, what it means, subordinated to him negated to him, attached to him. They're attached. What does an attachment mean? It's not we happen to be coincide. You coincide, that means you're not attached. But if you attach to Yaakov, and who is Yaakov? Yaakov is the Merkovo. Yaakov is the Shechina. So if I'm attached to you, it's, it's when, like you graft a branch onto a tree. It becomes part of the tree. They being attached to Yaakov, their grandfather, or their father, if Yaakov is the Shechina, they're attached to the Shechina. If you attach to the divine presence, you cannot be as much as touched <coughs> by anything which is pure. Because that level of attachment negates anything because you're synonymous with the Shechin itself. It continues. Bonov ubnei Bonov Ito, his sons, and the sons of his sons, Ito, again with him. Benosov, his daughters, Ubenos Benosov, Bechol Zaro, and the daughters of his sons, Hevi Ito, again, Mitzrayma. When Yaakov came to Egypt, what was the nature of the relationship? Fully attached. Ito, not Emo. So what is, it's not superfluous. Unless there was this level of attachment, intertwinement to Yaakov, they couldn't have survived. They wouldn't have survived. Even the, when Yaakov originally came, it's only because they were negated and they were subsumed by his essence, that's the reason why they weren't affected whatsoever. But what happens when he passes away? As much as you want to be negated, you have to be negated to something. The Shechin is no longer here. Because Yaakov is no longer here. So what happens? It starts seeping in. Because there's nothing to, to deflect the impurity of Egypt. There's nothing to dispel it because the Shechin is no longer here. Now, Yaakov understood that despite the fact, of course, he knew he was going to pass away and he knew ultimately there are going to be spiritual casualties. When we left after 210 years, at what level were we holding on the spiritual yardstick? Elo of David Azur of Elo of David Azur. The angel said, why are you drowning? Why are you killing the Egyptians in the, in the Yamsuf, in the Red Sea? The Jews are no less idolaters. Elo of the Avodos of Elo. We were pagans. 
We were pagans. And Yaakov knew ultimately that's where it was going. But at what level were we pagans when we left Egypt? We're at the 49th level of impurity. If you go beyond the 49th level, you go into sp spiritual oblivion, never to return. But if we stayed one month, we would, have, we would have actually been spiritually destroyed, never to return. But why were we able to survive it even to that degree? It's because what Yaakov had infused in the neshamas of the Jews initially when he was there, due to his presence, that structure, we were able to... Wouldn't have? Now, what do you need to, to establish that spiritual infrastructure? Everything has to be the ultimate security. So let's talk. The Gemara tells us that a person lives outside of Eretzel, it's as if you have no God. What do we have no God? We live here. We live in Chutz We live outside of Israel. We live in exile. Chas v'shol, what a Jew doesn't have a God. What is Mekein lo eloka? It's if he has no God. So the commentators explain that up among the of the world, each root nation, every as we see later. The was that's what happened. Egypt has its archangel. Every nation has its archangel. When Hashem gives and bracha to every nation on earth, it's filtered through that archangel. So if a Jew lives outside of Israel, outside of Canaan, you actually the Jew is not receiving what is meant to be his directly from God, but it's going through an intermediary. Who's the intermediary? The archangel. Receiving something through the in intermediary in terms of its dimension of holiness, of Kedusha, is not the same. Receiving it directly from Hashem versus going through the intermediary, it's a different dimension of reality. So therefore, Yaakov understood that. At what level do we have to establish this spiritual fortress in Egypt to betray that we're able to deflect every level of impurity? It has to be the ultimate level of purity. So what did he bring to Egypt? It's It's the possessions that he amassed in Canaan. Canaan has no archangel. Hashem himself oversees Eretz Yisrael. If that's the case, that shefa, that flow, that blessing, those possessions are directly from Hashem. Coming directly from Hashem, therefore, they're at the ultimate level of what? Of purity and have relevance to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Therefore, this will guarantee the survival, the spiritual survival of Klal Yisrael in Egypt. So we only brought the highest quality, spiritually speaking, the assets that were infused with the Kedusha to be able to create the spiritual infrastructure for us to survive the Golos. It's interesting, in terms of the Ito, the Ramchal writes, in the Derech Hashem, in the way of God, that everything in existence is finite except God Himself. God Himself is Ein Sof, He's infinite. So let's say a person, whatever he is, whatever the dimension of his soul is, even Moshe Rabbeinu, dimension was something not to be fathomed. The dimension of a Jew's soul, especially Moshe Rabbeinu's neshama, he was Shokol Keneged. Israel, his neshama was the equivalent of 600,000 Jews. He shokled, that's the meaning. He was the equivalent in the spiritual dimension. But is what, whatever it is, it's still finite. So Ramchal writes, how does a Jew take on an infinite persona, an infinite reality? So he says something interesting. He says that there's a mitzvah, bo, bo sid book. There's a mitzvah, positive thing, you should cleave to God. Now, if you have a branch and you graft it onto a tree and the graft is done correctly and perfectly, after a short period of time, that branch will eventually stop producing the fruit of that tree. Why? Because the branch becomes part of the ecosystem of the tree. So if a Jew attaches himself to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, 
he attaches his neshama to Hashem, that every aspect of his mind, his being, his feelings, is dedicated to God. So what do you become part of? You're no longer finite. Your system is no longer a finite system. You've become part of an infinite system. That's Botid book. You've attached yourself. So when Yaakov being the Merkava, being the chariot, the location of the Holy of Holies, what is that location? Yaakov and HaKadosh Baruch Hu are synonymous. He's fully imbued and in intertwined with the Shekhinah. So when his family goes to Egypt and every child, every grandchild is Ito. What does Ito mean? That means they're attached to him. They become an adjunct to him. When you become an adjunct, you merit that same Siyat Dishmaya. You have that exact same divine assistance, that same divine protection. Regardless of your minimal level, it's because what you attach yourself. As the finite being attached to Hashem, you become part of an infinite. So if you attach yourself to Yaakov, you know, his family, as Yaakov himself deflected all impurity, because they, he's the Shekhinah, so whoever attaches himself to him, they deflect it also, because they're part of his, his system, his spiritual system. The Ramchal writes something phenomenal. He says that if you have a great tzaddik who has, who's beloved and valued by Hashem and you facilitate the needs of that tzaddik and you accommodate the tzaddik to assist him in his service of Hashem, although the person who assists him is at a much level level, lesser level, he's elevated to the level of the tzaddik. Why? Because since this person is the one who faci is facilitating the service of the tzaddik to Hashem, he becomes one and the same with the tzaddik. That's all he says. But what's the understanding? The person who's dedicated to the tzaddik to accommodate all his needs, to accommodate his spirituality. What are you doing? That's a negation. That's, that's the concept of Ito. It's the concept what Yaakov did with his children, his cho all his progeny. His sons, his grandsons, his, grand, his sons, his granddaughters. Every per person who came to Egypt, they came Ito. And Yaakov understood, unless it's Ito, there is no quality, so you cannot survive. You cannot survive. You know, there's the famous Zohar. The Zohar says, Yisrael v'raisa v'kuchrichu chadu. The Jewish people, the Torah, and God are all in, in, intertwined. Now, how do you attach yourself to God? You can only attach yourself to God through the Torah itself. There's no greater attachment. The Gemara says, in a number of places, the mitzvah, the Pasuket, or both Tidbok, you should attach yourself. Somebody asks the question, how do you attach yourself to God? God is fire. Could you attach yourself to fire? Samara so says, a person marries Bas Talmud Chochem. You marry the daughter of Talmud Chochem. You assist the Talmud Chochem. You assist him in his livelihood. Because the Talmud Chochem is a representation of God. We're talking about a Talmud Chochem. is Tocho Kabaro. He's genuine, winely, whatever. He's on the outside, he's on the inside. It's, as you see by the Oron, the Gemara says, he buys him, he It's cast in gold on the inside, on the outside. He's genuinely what he is. It's not only he appears to be that, that is what he is. So that, what, but what is that? He's the receptacle for the Torah. He's the receptacle for the Shechina. If you assist him, you associate with yourself with him, then you become part of him. That's what it is. We find that after Yaakov passed away, the Torah tells us that Yosef's brothers were concerned regarding their relationship. The Torah says, Vayiru achi Yosef ki The brothers of Yosef saw that their father died. What do you mean they saw? And of course they knew he died. The Yom Lu Yistemenu Yosef. Now we're concerned he may hate us. He may take revenge for what we did to him. We sold him to slavery. We acted cruelly to him. And he will bring about all the evil that we had done to him. This is going to be revenge. Now, why did they suspect us? So Rashi cites Chazal. 
they recognized a, a change of relationship between themselves and Yosef after the father passed away. Why? As long as Yaakov was alive, they would dine and eat on his table. He was the viceroy. And he brought them close to him out of respect for his father. Once Yosef passed away, he, he no, they no longer ate at his table. He no longer treated in the same way. So how did they read this? They took this as an indication. Whatever happened until now, it's not because he really forgave them. It was only because he didn't want to in any way hurt his father's feelings because they were also his children. But now that the father's no longer here, he's ready to take revenge. He will hate us. He will bring upon us all the evil we brought about upon him. That's what they thought. And of course, they made up, they made up a story and Yosef cried, he says, definitely not, I will not do anything to you, and so on and so forth. But again, but the question is, after what Yosef had endured, you know, you could suppress pain and ill feeling for so long. They mistreated him, they act cruelly to him, they literally, they traumatized him at every level. I mean, how could you? How could you not, how long could you harbor these, suppress these, these, these negative feelings? But ya Yosef, Yosef didn't, didn't suppress feelings. He truly had no ill feelings towards his brothers. But they read it because they said, it doesn't make any sense. The only way our brother is able to suppress it is because our father's alive. But now that he's no longer alive, the way we read the nature of the relationship, it's not the same. It must be that the suppressed feelings are now coming to the surface. And now he's going to take revenge against us. That was his concern. That was their concern. So we once said, it's interesting, Yosef named his, his Bechor, Menashe. Why did he name him Menashe? So he named him Menashe because the Torah tells us, because he says, God caused me to forget all the suffering of my father's household that despite the levels of torture he had, emotional, mental, and physically, the way he was abused and humiliated, somehow, miraculously, it totally dissipated. It's like a person has a, a psychosis and every mental disorder, and the doctor says, take this pill, it's as if it never existed. What do you call that? That's a miracle. That's exactly what happened to Yosef. Despite his trauma, despite his negative feelings, despite his pain, and he could not forget what happened, almost instantaneously, totally dissipated. It's a miracle. So what was that a sign of? That's a sign that he has a mission, and if any of these negative feelings exist within his emotional mind, there's no way he could address that mission. Because he has to prepare the exile, which ultimately the Jews were going to see now. But if there's as much as the small, smallest degree of interference because of the negative feelings, he cannot succeed. As the provider, cannot. Hashem says, but you will be the provider, you'll be the one to set them in exile in Egypt to prepare them for the long period of time. And he sees, he's experiencing it. This is a miracle. So if, unless you experience the miracle, you don't understand the miracle. But Yosef experienced the miracle. Menashe. Ki nashani elokimi kalamoli. God caused me to forget, forget all my angst, all my trauma, all my pain. So this is something you name your firstborn. This is the most special thing. But let's see the brothers. The brothers couldn't even relate to this. They said he's a tzaddik. He's suppressing it. Humanly, it's an impossibility. How do you survive this? So what Yosef experienced, they can relate to. They have no idea what happened. So now when they see there's a distancing in relationship, what are they attributed to? Now the suppressed feelings are coming to the surface. Now he's going to take revenge. That's what's going to happen. But factually, he didn't even have to forgive them. It's as if it never happened. There wasn't even a basis for forgiveness. So when originally he had kissed him and he cried, when he revealed who he was, in truth... He truly forgave them. He did forgive them. But they couldn't understand it. How is it possible? Humanly, it's an impossibility. Mm -hmm. So from their, their vantage point, they have what to worry. But where he's coming from, which only he knows, which he could only know, it's an impossibility. 
there's a story they tell over, which I heard many years ago. In the uh, 19th century, the Russians conquered Poland, and the, Polish, the Poles were under the heel of the Russians. In the latter part of the 19th century, there was a revolution in Poland with the King of Poland, who was in exile, what led the revolution, and they throw off the, the yoke of the Russians. And they regained their, their independence. And he was like reinstated as the king, the king of Poland. So what happened? But when the revolution was going on, the Russians, the Tsar's army, they were hunting the king of Poland. They were hunting him. So what happened? He goes and he runs into a house, home of a Jew. An observant Jew. And he says, you have to hide me. Because if they can't, they find me, they're going to kill me. So the Jew says to the king, and he says, the king of Poland. He says, but if I hide you and they find you in my house, they will kill me and they will kill my whole family. And they may have a pogrom, they'll kill out endless Jews. He says, you have no choice. You have to save me. So he thinks, well, well, how is he going to save him? If they come in the house, there's, there's not going to be a floorboard which they're not going to tear up, looking in every crevice and cranny for the king of Poland. So what happened? He, all of a sudden, the Jew had an idea. He says, you know something? He says, I have a prayer shawl. I have a pair of tefillin. I'll put them on you. I'll put the talus. You put it over your head. I'll show you how to sway. Stand in the corner. I'll give you a, a prayer book. And you, sh you just sway in the corner. They come in. Well, we hope that they won't notice you. They'll say there's a Jew praying in the corner. Sure enough, he puts on this whole attire. The talus, the tefillin, the talus over his head. He's swaying in the corner. All of a sudden, the Russian soldiers, they come in. They rough up the head of the household. We were looking for this, turn the house, destroy most of the house, and they notice a man swaying in the corner. Don't pay, pay any attention, they leave. And this Jew saved the day. With this ploy, with this idea of disguising him as a Jew, they saved the king of Poland, and as a result of this, the king of Poland was reinstated as king. But before the king left his house, after the Russians went off, the Jew says to the king of Poland, when they came in and you were under the talus wearing my tefillin, swaying, what, what, what did it feel like? The king didn't even respond. Did not respond. So what happened was when he was reinstated, they had a large banquet celebrating the reestablishment of the dominion of Poland. The king is, is, is going gonna, is gonna to rule again. So they, who did they sit up as one of the guests of honor? The Jew. Because the Jew saved the life of, of the king. If not for the king, the revolution would have failed. So, right when they announced, they said, this Jew, he saved my life, and that's why Poland's here, and we're going to reward him. And what's going to be his reward? At this moment, we're taking him to the gallows, and he's going to be hanged. That's, the Jew hears this. He's like, he doesn't understand what's going on here. I mean, here, because of his putting his life in jeopardy, saving the king's life, this is the thank you. They take him to the gallows. Two soldiers go and grab him, grab the Jew, drag him off to the gallows, and they built a special gallows to hang him. To hang the Jew. They put the noose around his neck, and they tighten it around his neck, and the execution is about to drop the floorboard. He's going to fall to his death. So the Jew says to the king, he says, he says the king says to the Jew, you have one last request. Any question you want to ask, you could ask. He says, oh, the question I want to ask is, is this the thank you for what I did for you? Why are you doing this? He says, I'll tell you why I'm doing this. When, before I left your house, you asked me a question. What did it feel like when they came hunting for me? The answer is, you don't know unless you're there. Now you know exactly what it means. And he took the noose off his neck and he let him go. You asked me, how does it feel? I, gave, I, I explained to you how it feels. Unless you're at that point where your life is about to be snuffed out, you have no idea what it means. That's what the king of Poland... And then he released him. He never intended to kill him. But he was, he was acquiescing to his request because there's no way to answer. There's certain questions you can't answer. Unless you're there, you don't understand what it is. Yosef, to be able to be relieved of the trauma of the past, of what he suffered emotionally, mentally, physically, it's an impossibility. 
It's a nest. It's a miracle. But Joseph experienced it. His brothers could not fathom, could not relate to this. It's an impossibility. And because it's the possibility, how could he forgive us? He definitely did not forgive us. So what happened? It's a suppression of feelings. As long as our father was alive, he suppressed it. Now that he, we see there's a distance, evidently those feelings are coming to the surface. He's about to take revenge. And Yosef says, no, God forbid, ne never, I will not. Not that he understood it. But their understanding from their vantage point, that's an impossibility. But Yosef, in reality, so let's understand now. Chazal tell us that the reason why we experienced the Asur Hurgi Malchus, the ten martyrs who were killed in one generation, who were the greatest Torah sages from Sinai until then who lived in one generation. It was an atonement for the sale of Yosef into slavery. That's what it was. So, but the question is, Yosef said, seemingly, he, he forgave them. He says, I have no claim against you. So if he had no claim against him, what do we need atonement? For what? For what? For the, for the sale of Yosef into slavery. And what was the payment we paid? Asar Rubi Malchus, Rabbi Akiva, the Chaveiro of Akiva and his colleagues. It's something which is not to be understood. The dimension of greatness, what, what, what they endured, and what, the, what, what Klaus had lost for all eternity. The, the level of who they were, Rabbi Akiva, Oke Horim Vetochen Zubazu. He uproots mountains and he grinds them together. That was his greatness. This is Rabbi Akiva. What's the Mida Kenegad Mida? The understanding is we find that they came up with a story that Yosef was killed by a beast and they took his tunic and they dipped it in blood and they said, is this your son's garment? From that moment, Yaakov went into a depression. He grieved for 22 years. After 22 years, when Yosef sent the wagons and he realized that Yosef is still alive and he believed the story, it says, Vatechi Ruach Yaakov Aviem. The spirit of Yaakov was enlivened. So Rashi says, name it Chazal, Ruach HaKodesh. The divine presence came back to him. Meaning, for 22 years he was detached. Yaakov not prophesizing for 22 years. What detriment, what loss did they bring about on the eternity of Klal Yisrael? Yaakov's, Yaakov's ten children. If Yaakov would have prophesied for an additional 20 years, what levels of advancement of spirituality would have Yaakov achieved? It's something we can't even relieve, we can't even relate to one moment of advancement. This 22 years, due to what they had done, they denied that to their father. So we're talking about a level of spirituality, we may be a different Klausel today if they wouldn't have done what they did. We would have a level of clarity, a dimension of Kedusha, which we could have weathered storms differently because of that infusion of Kedusha. 22 years of Yaakov's prof prophecy. So what's the Midah and Eged Midah? Do you know what happens when Hashem took these 10 martyrs, when the 10 greatest Torah sages in one generation, that there weren't such 10 people from the time of Sinai? the world became darkened. There was a void of clarity in Torah. Just as you created the void in clarity by denying your father prophecy, Ruach HaKodesh, divine vision for 22 years, which you denied Klai levels of advancement not to be understood, Klai Yisrael, Mida Kenegad Mida, will suffer that same. Ten martyrs. This is the measure for measure. And that's the reason why. So it has nothing to do with the sale. It's the, the sale was only the medium through which this terrible tragedy took place. That's the Mida Kenegad Mida. Said over, the Gemara tells us, interesting story, we'll end with this, that there was a great Amora, his name was Rav Kahana. He was a Babylonian. One of the greatest Torah sages of Babylon. <coughs> And there was a Jew who was an informer, Jewish informer. A Jewish informer, his status is he's a pursuer, and you're, he, deserves to, he deserves to be put to death because he, through his informing, he's killing Jews. So Rakana, being one of the leading Torah sages, he summons this Jew, and he says to him, you realize if you continue in this way, we're going to have to kill you. 
because you're a pursuer. The moment he tells him this, he realizes he's going off to inform on him. What does Rav Khanna do? He takes the informer and he breaks his neck. And he kills him, and which, he's per which he's obligated to kill him because this informer he was informs on him this is based on the principle Habola person who rises to kill you self-defense you have an obligation to defend your life and kill your attacker so what happens but factually even if a person has to kill it's a bad omen it's a bad omen so if it's a bad omen he realized he has to do he has to he needs kapori he needs atonement so if kind of accepted upon himself seven years of silence that would, he will not reveal his greatness in Torah. That's what he accepted. And he had to flee Babylon because he was a fugitive. Because he killed the government informer. He flees to Yushalayim. And when he's in who does he meet? The first meet, person he meets in Yushalayim, he meets the primary student of Rabbi Yochanan, Rish Lokish. As he says to Rish Lokish, by the way, what, what he's been discussing recently in the, in the study halls, he shares with him. The moment he hears a little bit, he interacts with him. Rish Lokish, who's one of a kind of Torah sages, is dazzled. He's never seen anything like this. He immediately goes, runs to his Rebbe, to Rebbe Yochanan. He says, Ari Olami Bovil. A lion has just descended from Babylon. We've never seen anything like this. So, of course, Rebbe Yochanan is excited. Rebbe Yochanan is a very old man. He's 140 years old at this time. And he says, bring him in immediately. So they had seven rows of students. So they put... Rav Yochanan, they put Rav Kana in the first row and they put a question to Rav, Yo, to Rav Kana because he's such a great, they, evidently he's such a great Torah sage. But Rav Kana said he, he's going to remain silent. He's not going to re reveal his greatness. Tim, he remained silent. So they put him back a row. They put another question in him, put him back finally sitting in the seventh row. So he says to himself, the seven rows of being put back, that level of humiliation should be the equivalent of seven years of silence, of not revealing my Torah. So he says to Rish Lokish, I want to start from the first question. They start the first question back and forth. He outpaces Rabbi Yochanan, and Rabbi Yochanan actually, Rabbi Yochanan who sat on seven cushions. For every time he had responded in a way where he outdid Rabbi Yochanan, they removed the cushion. To find the Rabbi Yochanan sitting on the floor, on the ground. Rabbi Yochanan had very long eyelashes. And the only way he was able to see, they'd have to take silver tongues and lift his eyelashes. So he wanted to see, what does this man look like? This man is just unbelievable. He never saw anything like it. He bested the, rab the rabbi. And he sees Rabbi Kana, and he sees he has a smirk on his face. He has a smirk. And the moment he has that smirk, it says he was taken aback. He was like, felt bad. And the moment he felt bad, Rav Kana dies. Because he felt bad. After Rav Kana passes away, the students tell him he wasn't smirking. He had a deformity of the lip, which looked like he was smirking, but factually, he was not, God forbid, mocking the rabbi whatsoever. So, Rabbi Bachi asks a question. You mean to say, Rav Kana was, 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 was holy of holy? He was the leading Torah sage. He's the author of the Jerusalem Talmud of Yushalmi. You mean to say he has Ayn Ara. The evil eye comes, there's something evil within the person. But it says he looked at him, he was taken aback and he died. So Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar says something similar to what we're saying. He says, Rabbi Yochanan in his lifetime never had a lapse of Torah thought in his life. Never. When he thought Rav Kahana was smirking at him, he was the cause of that Torah lapse. Because he caused the Torah lapse for Rabbi Yochanan, that's why he deserved to die. This, this is Rabbi Yochanan's Torah lapse. So if the sons of Yaakov, due to this charade, this fiction that they created, that Yosef was devoured by a beast, he was denied the vua for 22 years. How much lapse? What is the, the, the consequence? What's the ramification of that? It's, it's beyond, beyond, beyond. It's not something which, which can be fathomed. You know what the, the cost price is? Asaruge Malchus. The ten martyrs, the greatest sages live one generation, which they illuminate the world. The world's going dark. That's the Medic and Egan Medah. To be continued.